All right, praise God. You know, last week, um, I, uh, as, as I was preaching last week, there was a very, very strong anointing last week. And, and, and I have to tell you, that, that was probably, um, in my opinion, it was probably one of the best sermons I've ever preached. And there was such a strong anointing. And, and, and God is, here's what I, I want to share with you this morning. And, and, and I've got a bunch of notes over there. I just don't know if I'm going to get to them. And um, because, you know, last week we talked about what, what Jesus did, how that he suffered and how he went through all the pain and all of the distresses and everything that he did. And he went to the cross and he, he died on the cross and then he went to the grave and then he rose from the dead so that you and I could have life and have it more abundantly. And we all know that, right? We all, everybody in here knows that, am I, am I right? He went to the cross because the Bible says that for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever should, whosoever uh, that, that believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world but that the world might be saved through him. Now we all know that, right? We, we all know that. Then how come we don't walk in abundance all the time? The Bible says that in John 10.10 10, that the enemy came but for to kill, steal, and destroy. But Jesus came. He went to the cross. He took the nails in his feet, the nails in his wrist. He took all of that pain, the crown on his head, the sword in his side. He experienced all of that so that you and I could have life and have it more abundantly. So why don't we live abundant life? Why are Christians always going through stuff? And why are they always getting all bound up and sick and diseased and, and, and having financial issues and all of these things? Well, it's because there's a devil out there. And he came to kill, steal, and destroy. But Jesus came that we could have life and have it more abundantly. But it's our choice. It's our decision. You can choose to allow the enemy to destroy your life or you can choose the way of God and the promises of God and live in victory and abundance. It's your choice. It's your choice. We go through life and, and we make decisions. You know, we, we, I hear people pray all the time. Well, I'm just praying. It's my desire. This is my desire. And I'm praying. And, and God's going to give me this. And God's going to give me that. And, 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 and you didn't ask God if it was His desire. And then you get it all on your own. And you're in a great big mess. And then you go, oh, God. Have you ever wished that you could be God for a day? Sometimes I'd just like to say, or, or, or maybe, maybe I wish that God had Tim Jenkins' attitude once in a while. And he'd just say, you big dummy, I didn't tell you to do it anyway. You did it on your own. You made your own choices, your own decisions. You didn't confer with me. The Bible says that God will give you the desires of your heart. But listen to me, that's only if the desires line up with the Word of God. And so many times we need to find out what the Bible says about what's going on in our lives. Listen. There's a man, and he was going to be here today, and, and, and he didn't make it. And he was homeless. And he was addicted to drugs and addicted to alcohol and, and other things and had all kinds of issues. And most of you in here, if I told you who he was, you'd know. You would recognize him. But listen to me. One day, he made a decision and he said, I'm not going to be this man anymore. And I'm going to walk out of that grave. 
So he made his way to one of the most amazing ministries in all of the world called Celebrate Recovery. And he hooked up with a group of people that surrounded him and, and started teaching encouragement and started teaching the true word of God to him and started helping him and started lifting him up in prayer instead of tearing him down with words and condemnation. And today, he's drug free. He owns a home. He has a great job. He has his own vehicle. And he's living for God. He's living for God. But he had to make a choice. He had to make a decision. He had to say one day, he had to say, you know what? I want to be free from all of this junk. And so he made his way into a meeting and he found a group of people that said, we love you like Jesus, and we accept you where you're at. But we're going to help you to change. Instead of saying, oh, you did this, we don't want you. You did that, you can't come here. You had that problem, we don't want those problems in here. They embraced him, and they loved him, and they cared about him the same way that my Savior that hung on the cross for him embraces him and loves him and cares about him. And that's the same Savior that did the exact same thing for you. It doesn't matter what you're struggling with. It doesn't matter what's going on in your life. My God is still the same God that is alive and doing well today. He's the same Jesus that walked out of that grave so that you and I could have victory and walk in a life that's full of abundance. It's important that we make decisions that are going to help us in life. It's important that we get an understanding of what God's Word is. Let, let, let me tell you what God's Word is, and, and, and I can sum it up with one word simply because I've experienced it. It's love. It's love. I can tell you what it's not. It's not religion. It's not. It's not condemnation. You know, I, I, have, I have here here recently, God has really, really placed it on my heart. To reach out to those people that nobody wants. To reach out in Wise County, in this area, to reach out to the people that the other churches don't want. And, and, and we've been having Celebrate Recovery, and Jerry and Jane have been running that, and, and, and I thought, well, great, it's, you know, it's another ministry of the church. And then in the past month or so, man, God has opened my eyes to what it really is all about. Listen, Celebrate Recovery is not just about being addicted to drugs or to alcohol. It's about recovering from the things that the devil did to try and destroy lives. And so last week, we went over to the youth center. The week before that, Celebrate Recovery, it was packed. And we needed more room. Imagine that. Seems like something I deal with every day now. Used to, everybody used to come to me and say, Pastor, we need money, we need money, we need money. And now they're saying, we need room. So when we built the youth center, we actually decked 
part of the, the, the building and to make a second floor and we're going to use it for storage with the plans that in a couple of years we would probably turn it into classrooms. A couple of years is here. And we started framing it last week. And within a couple of weeks, we're going to have classrooms over there. So listen to me. Listen. I'm tired of Christians living defeated lives. I'm tired of it. So we're going to utilize the tools that God has given us and celebrate recoveries just one. But we're going to utilize those tools and those ministries. We're going to open that up. Listen to me. If you are struggling, if you've been through a hurt or been through a divorce or been through any of that stuff that, that has just crushed your heart, you need to get hooked up and celebrate recovery and go through that process. But you've got to take a step. Listen to me. God acts upon our faith. And the way that we demonstrate our faith is by taking steps. And sometimes they're baby steps. And sometimes they're great big steps. But you got to take a step. We're going to be talking about over the next three weeks, we're going to be talking about being set free and having freedom in our lives. How many of you want freedom? I mean, seriously. We're a nation that was built upon freedoms, right? Then why do we get ourselves all bound up in the religious things that cause us so much bondage in our lives? Like condemnation. I'll give you a prime example of condemnation. To me, it's kind of funny. When I walk into Walmart and I'm walking through the store and I see somebody that goes to our church and they look at me and all of a sudden they look like a deer in the headlights and they turn and they start running, I know I've done this enough, I've been down this road enough, I know exactly what it is. They got deer in their basket. <laughs> I know, I've seen them run out the door, leave their carts right there. And then on Sunday, I say, man, it was good to see you at Walmart. I wasn't at Walmart. <laughs> really? Well, I put your beer back in the icebox. <laughs> That's condemnation. Listen to me. Because it's all this religious stuff about if you do this, you're going to hell. But you can gossip. I went there. Lord Jesus. Y'all just remember I preached good last week. <laughs> Listen, we allow ourselves to get all caught up in all this bondage that other people put on us. And we need to learn to walk in the freedoms that we have because of the blood of Jesus. You see, if I'm in Walmart, or you're in Walmart, not me, if you're in Walmart and you're walking down the aisle and you got a basket full of brewskis, okay, and Jesus walks in, he ain't going to condemn you to hell. Are you listening to me? He's going to love on you. He's going to encourage you. He's going to lift you up. And he's going to correct you. But he's not going to condemn you. And we need to learn to walk in his love and not the condemnation of this world. If we really want to experience 
spiritual freedom. We've got to get out of condemnation. The Bible says there's therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. So what about the guy that's been to prison? What about, what about the woman that murdered her husband? Ooh, that's one of them bad sins. Not for my Jesus. So how dare us, and I'm talking about the body of Christ, how dare us to say things like, we, we don't want those kind of rules. We, we, we don't, you know, we're, we're just, we, we just, we just don't. You see, I think we ought to hang up a new sign that says The Rock, a hospital for sinners. I do. I don't want to be a country club for saints. Because I don't know about you, but I've messed up a time or two. Now, it hadn't been in a while. <laughs> but we need to... <laughs> yeah. Honey. <laughs> Listen to this. Listen to this. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14. It says, Do not be yoked together with unbelievers. For what do righteousness and wickedness have in common? Or what does fellowship, or what fellowship can light have with darkness? What harmony is there between Christ and Belial? What does a believer have in common with an unbeliever? What agreement is there between the temple of God and idols? For we are the temple of the living God, as God has said. I will live with them and walk among them, and I will be their God, and they will be my people. Therefore, come out from them and be separate, says the Lord. Touch no unclean thing, and I will receive you. That word yoked in the Greek, is herda zugado, herda guzado. And what that means is this, is to have a close or common fellowship with someone or something. Now many of us have used that passage of Scripture and we've told our kids, <laughs> don't you be unequally yoked now. Don't you do that. And we really like to use it when they're dating somebody we don't like. <laughs> yeah, I know I'm not the only one that's been there. But, but listen to me. It's talking about building a close relationship with them that are basically heathens. Okay? It's talking about being yoked together. Listen, walking in agreement with them. It doesn't say to stay away from them. We're called to be a witness to them and to reach them. And so whenever we read that passage of Scripture, we need to keep that in mind. We don't need to be hanging out with them. Listen, if, if you're a drunk, and you know the difference between a drunk and an alcoholic. An alcoholic goes to the meetings. Okay? I'm on a roll today. And, and, and so, so, but listen to me. If you're a drunk, you don't need to be hanging out in the bars. That's what the scripture's telling us. If you're struggling with anger in your life, then you don't, you don't need to be hanging out with people that's going to make you angry. 
So therefore, I never can drive again. It's, it's telling us, and it's not just speaking to teenagers. Sometimes we need to read that scripture while we're looking in the mirror. And we need to realize that the people that we have yoked ourselves with, listen to me, in other words, we've put ourselves in closeness, in close fellowship with them, are going to cause us a lot of problems and we're going to get all wrapped up in all kinds of bondage. You know, I, I've learned some things in life. I'm going to be 60 in December. So I, you know, I'm getting real close to being at that age. And, and you're saying, what is that age? I, I don't know. But here's what I know. He, and, and, and sometimes I look forward to it. Have you ever noticed that? Mm, that older people... And, and I can't wait till I get to this point in life. They just say what they want to. They, they do. They, they, it don't matter. I mean, they're just like, you know, they, they, just, they just look at you. They just say what they want to because they just figure they're old enough. What are you going to do? Get mad at them? They don't care. And then they also know that, well, you know, they're kind of old. So we just make excuses for grandma. You know, we've all got that grandma or that aunt, and, and you go to Christmas dinner, and, and she looks at you, she goes, Well, my Lord, you're getting fat. <laughs> oh, just forgive her. She loves you, and she's old. You know? And so that's what happens, listen to me, with sin and bondage. We learn to just accept it. And before we know it, it's got us all wrapped up. It's got us all in a great big mess. You know, when, when I was in high school, and I don't know if I want to go there. Anyway, when I was in high school, I, I, I was 16 years old. And this friend of mine, he gave me a beer. It was the worst tasting thing. I ever put in my mouth. It was horrible. But I was at a party. So I walked around all night long with that can of beer. All night long. So the next party came along. Walked in the door. They gave me a beer. Walked around. Had that beer. I was cool. Let me tell you what. I had a beer in this hand and a cigarette in this hand, and I've never smoked a cigarette in my life. But I was cool. And I walked around. And then a friend of mine said, Hey, you need another beer? Oh, sure. Several weeks went by, and it went from one beer to two beers to five beers to 20 beers. I ain't exaggerating. And then I found out I could outdrink all my friends. And I had all this popularity because I was the best drunk in school. There was just a problem with that. God called me to preach. And so I'm trying to get them to come to church with me on Sunday morning, and I'm out drinking them on Friday night. Don't look at me like that. There's some of you who've been in the same boat. But here's what happened. I came home one night. I was in a way that I shouldn't have been in. I know none of you have ever experienced that. My dad, who is normally in bed by 10 o'clock, was not in bed. And I walked in the house and I was knocking mirrors off the wall and sconces off the wall and all this stuff trying to get to my room. And I turned down the hallway as quick as I could so that 
he wouldn't see me. And the next thing I know, my dad had his hand on my shoulder. And I turned around and he was standing there. He said, son, are you drunk? No. <laughs> and all of a sudden, tears began to run down his cheeks. I mean big tears. And he wrapped his arms around me. He said, I love you with all of my heart. But don't you ever ever come in my home drinking again. He said, but I love you. And don't you ever forget that. But your decisions and your choices are going to have consequences and you don't need to ever forget that for the rest of your life. The next morning, I woke up. Whew, it was a tough day. My dad come in my bedroom. He said, get up. I said, yes, sir. He said, we got work to do. It was 147 degrees outside. And I'm working, and he's sitting in the pickup, smiling as I was sweating profusely. He said, that's the way we'll be spending the next six months of Saturdays together. Okay, Dad. He said, by the way, I love you. He said, I love you. And you know what? This is what I knew. That wasn't condemnation. That was the Father's love. Because here's what he did. He loved me. He corrected me. And he loved me through the correction. And then he loved me and he forgave me when it was over. And that's something that we all need to do in our own lives. You see, we have to be cautious in the things that we're doing and who we're hanging out with and, and what we're associating ourselves because there's some things that are going to cause you some real problems in life, in your spiritual life, and cause you to get all bound up spiritually. And, and, and here's some things, three things that I want to tell you about this morning real quick. The first one is this. you got to get rid of doubt. Listen. You, you, you got to quit speaking doubt and unbelief into your life. The Bible says that the words of your mouth will direct your steps. The Bible says that death and life are in the power of the tongue. And so it's important that, that we get away from doubt and unbelief because really doubt and unbelief is the lack of faith. What you're saying is this, is when you begin to doubt, you're beginning to say, God, I don't believe you. And it's important that we get doubt and unbelief out of our life. The second thing is, is, is we got to get negativity out of our life. And, and we have to be careful about being around people that are always negative. Statements like this, well, your grandpa was a drunk. Your daddy was a drunk. So you're just going to be a drunk. Now, contrary to popular belief, my sermon is not on beer this morning. <laughs> Your mama was a drug addict, so you're just going to be a drug addict. Those negative things. You know, my daughter, one of my daughters, she, she was actually really smart, and, and she used to do something, and she did it for attention, and she would say all the time, she'd say, I'm so stupid. I'm so ugly. My hair is terrible. And so finally one day I sat her down and I said, you're not ugly, you're not stupid, your hair's not terrible. 
You're a child of the Most High God. You have the mind of Christ and the wisdom of God. And my God is not stupid. So I don't want to hear you say that ever again. Because that's not who you are. And we have to get past that. We have to get past the negativity. Oh, I could never do that. I could never accomplish that. I could never go there. I could never do that. Oh, 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 pastor, I, I, could, never, I could never lead a group. I could never pray. I went to dinner one time with a couple... And uh, they've been in church their whole life. Their whole life. Okay? And so, so what do you do when you go to dinner? Especially if it's with the pastor. You pray. Okay? You pray before you eat. Okay? That's just what you're supposed to do. Now, you don't ever do that again, but you, you know. And, and so, so, so here we are. We're sitting at dinner. And so I asked him, I said, now he's gone to church his whole life. He's a grown man. Very active in the church. And I said, I said, would you uh would you like to pray? He said, Nope. I said, What? He said, I don't pray in front of people. I said, Well, guess what, Bucko? You are today. Because I'm your pastor, and you're gonna step out of that box. And he prayed a simple, simple prayer over a meal. Listen to me. And he just began to weep. He just began to cry. He said, you don't know how long that I've been in bondage to that. Scared to death to pray in front of anybody because I was afraid I would say the wrong thing. I said, listen... You're just talking to your dad. We can't allow ourselves to get into all of this bondage and all of the negativity and, 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 and all of the doubt and unbelief. The last thing is this, is, man, we can't, we can't allow ourselves. Are, are you ready for this? The third thing that will keep you in bondage spiritually. This, this is a hard one, okay? Sin. Sin. Oh, well, well, Pastor, we don't preach against that no more in the church. Let, let me tell you something. Sin will kill, steal, and destroy. Sin will send you straight to hell, and there is a hell in case anybody doubts that, there is a hell. And unless you are forgiven of those sins by the Lord Jesus Christ because of what He did for us, then that's exactly where you're going to go. Now, that's not hell, fire, and brimstone. That's just the truth. And if you're in bondage spiritually and, and all bound up and feel like you're just defeated all the time, and it's because of sin, then here's what you need to do. You need to get rid of the sin. Whether it's, I'm not going to say getting drunk. Because I've been talking about that too much. If it's gossiping, if it's stealing, it, it, whatever it is, Jesus paid the price. But sometimes, listen to me, that word yoked there in that passage of Scripture is actually a verb, okay? Now, remember when we were in school and they taught us about verbs? That's an action word, okay? And so that means that we have to actually do something on our part. So are we yoking ourselves together with good fellowship or not so good fellowship? Listen, only you know. I, I had a, a, a man come into my office years ago. He's like the godliest man in the church, I, I thought. 
He had the perfect haircut, the Christian haircut. You know what I'm talking about? You know, he didn't have he. You know, you know he he was clean shaven. He was he's a big muscled up. I hated him, guy. You know, no, I didn't mean that. We're in church, and here he was. He was all muscled up, all clean cut, looked great, and and you know, and always wore the perfect clothes and the perfect shoes. And and I'm boy, he was. Perfect. One day he made an appointment to come in and talk to me. He got there and he walked into my office and he said, You're not recording this, are you? No. Do I need to? He said, you mind if I close this door to my office? I said, that's fine. He closed the door and he locked it. And I thought, do I need my gun? What is fixing to happen here? And he said, he said, Pastor, he said, all of my life is perfect. I have the perfect marriage. I have the perfect family. I have perfect kids. I have the perfect business. I got all this stuff. Everything that I've ever dreamed of. He said, but I got one big problem that's destroying all of that behind the scenes. And he said, and nobody knows about it. And he said, and I got to get I said, okay. So I'm sitting here and I'm thinking, this cat's fixing to tell me he just killed somebody and nobody knows or something. And he says, Pastor, he said, I have a real problem. A real problem with pornography. And I'm obsessed with it. And he said, and here's what I want you to do. I want you to pray over me and I want God to deliver me from that instantly right now today and be done with it. I said, you know, God can definitely do that. I said, but usually God requires us to take some steps. And I said, so let me tell you how you can deal with that and it's going to help you tremendously. He said, okay, tell me. I said, I want you to go home and I want you to tell your wife what you just told me. <laughs> what? I said, listen. Remember when you got married and y'all became one? She's your best friend. You just told me that. She loves you more than anybody does in this earth. You told me that. She might be upset with you at first. But she's going to help you overcome the adversities that are going on in your life because she loves you. And it's going to help you get past that because after you tell her that, she's going to be checking your computer and your phone and all your secret places that you think she doesn't know about but she does he said I'm going to do it he came back to me several weeks later and he said it's over it's done it's finished I don't have a problem anymore. And my wife knows about all of it. And he said, you were right. She loves me. And she helped me. And she encouraged me. He said, she was madder than an old wet hen in the beginning. But she loved me. And you know what? Listen. We have to make changes in our life. We've got to get sin out of our life. 
God puts people in your lives to help you. Your spouses, your family, your friends, your church family. Celebrate Recovery, Sozo, all of the different ministries that we, we have here at the church are so that we don't have to live in bondage. Man, I want to be free. I want to be free. You know, it, it, it's, it, it's, I want this church to be so free that when you walk in here, it's just like a breath of fresh air. And it's just like, man, this is awesome. Because we just breathe in the freedom of the Holy Spirit and know that we're not in bondage to sin anymore. And we're not in bondage to negativity and doubt and unbelief. But we walk in victory. And because we walk in victory, there ain't no grave, no grave going to hold me down. No grave. So if you're struggling in your life today, there are answers. There are answers. You know, there, there's a lot of people here today, and there's, there's some of you here today, man, you've been struggling with things in your life for a long time, and, 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 and it's affecting all of your life. You see, here's the thing about sin, guys, is it doesn't just affect that area of your life. Okay, it affects every area because it affects you and your family and everybody you're around. So make a decision today. If you're struggling in an area of your life, say, God, here it is. Now show me what to do. And then listen to him when he tells you. Listen to him and make those changes. You know, the most important decision that you will ever make in your life is not your career, not the house you buy, not even the person that you marry. The most important decision that you will ever make in your life is this. I've decided that I'm going to follow Jesus. And if you're here today and you've never made that decision and you'd say today, you know what? I need Jesus in my life. I'm making a decision today to follow him. I want him to come into my heart. I want to accept him as my savior. If that's you and you've never done that, you want to do that today, raise your hand. You say, I need Jesus. I need Jesus. Listen, don't let fear stop you from receiving the greatest thing that God has ever given us. Don't allow that to keep you in bondage. You say, well, most churches bow their heads and close their eyes. We used to. But we don't do that no more. And here's why we don't do that. Because we love you. And you don't need to hide it. And God loves you. And I love you. And I'm going to ask you one more time. If there's anybody here and you want to ask Jesus into your heart today, raise your hand right now. I see that hand. Is there anybody else? Anybody else? There's some more. Anybody else? I want Jesus. I want him in my life today. Anybody else? You can put your hand down. Maybe you're here this morning and you say, Pastor, I know I'm born again. I know that I'm saved, but man, I've been so in bondage to sin and all this junk that's going on in my life and I'm just tired of it and I want to be set free today and I want to make things right between me and God. If that's you, raise your hand right now. See that hand and that hand and that hand. Right, that hand. That hand. Is there anybody else? 
I'm tired. I'm tired of being in bondage. I want to make things right between me and God today. Is there anybody else? I want everybody to pray this prayer with me. Say, Heavenly Father, thank you for sending your Son to die for me. I believe that Jesus is the Son of God and that God raised Him from the dead so I can be saved. I ask you to forgive me of my sins. Come into my life. In Jesus' name, amen.